Welcome to Brazen Education with Educator Barnes, a podcast with a focus on speaking your truth, being transparent to help others, and having no shame about it. Because we can't move forward until the truth is known. Hey, it's Educator Barnes here, and today my topic is a crucial conversation about assessment in the classroom. Here lately, I've been frustrated as a parent. Most teachers are also parents, so they're dealing with education from the side of their school, and then they're dealing with education as a parent. And sometimes it's hard when you are a parent educator to walk that fine line of advocating for your child and telling your child's teacher what he or she needs to do. And for me, it's really hard because There are things that are happening that I strongly believe are wrong and unnecessary and that schools are doing things that are damaging our children, especially our black children. And I am a black parent. And so I always come at the angle. And when I talk to the school, I make it very clear that I'm advocating for my child and I'm advocating in a certain way because we are black parents and we have black children. In particular, we are raising two black sons in America. And and if you need me to elaborate more on why that's so crucial, then um, you're just going to have to go and do some research because I don't have time to address all that on this podcast today. But the one thing that's made me frustrated lately is assessment. So let's talk about assessment and the purpose, because, you know, if you're going to talk about a topic, you probably should give a little definition. So the purpose of assessment is to gauge where a student is, to get some information, get some feedback. So you're up there, you're teaching something, right? And then you're going to assess it and then you're going to see where the gaps are. So you're seeing a couple of things. Hey, like I I must have taught this effectively because almost everyone has mastered these skills and these standards. Right. And side note, your assessment should be aligned to skills and standards. So if you are assessing something and it isn't, you need to stop right there. And then you're taking that feedback and determining whether you need to move forward in your curriculum or circle back and do a reteach. Right. So um, I have identical twin boys and last school year they were in the same classroom. Um, well, well, let me go back. Pre-K three, we were in the same classroom. Pre-K four, we were in the same classroom. Um, first semester, second semester, they were not only split up in two separate classrooms, we actually split them up into two separate schools. Kindergarten, different classrooms. First grade, different classrooms. <clears throat> Last year, second grade, they were together. Um, some people question, like, why did you do that? And let me tell you, when you have twins, everybody and their mama have opinions on twins because they're, you know, their mama, sister, cousin knew somebody that had twins. And if you follow me on social media, every once in a while, I post this meme. Um, it's uh, Batman. It's like old school Batman slapping Robin in the face. And the meme says, um, um, some, the person like starts off saying something about twins. And the Batman slapping Robin saying, don't talk to me about twins because you don't have twins. So first of all, I always tell people, if you don't have twins, like, and I mean, like, you are the parent and you are raising twins, don't come holler at me and don't tell me anything about twins and don't question my decisions about it. Because because your kids were born, like, don't tell me, oh, I had Irish twins, you know, they were born close. No. Born close, that means at one point in time, and I know I'm going on a little side tangent, that means at one point in time, you have one baby by yourself. One point in time. So do not try to tell me no. Mm -mm -mm. Till you've sat there and dealt with two crying babies, trying to change two diapers, trying to feed two babies, trying to wrangle, tangle, (laughs) mess with two kids at the same time, all the time, because I've never had the experience of raising one child at one time. Do not come talk to me about what I'm doing. And so the main thing I advocate when I'm talking just about talking to parents of multiples or talking about multiples is that the parents know what is best. So in second grade, we decided it was in the best interest of our children to put them together. Uh, For us, it made it great for the parents side because we're dealing with one teacher. Same expectations. And if one of my kids didn't know what the heck was going on, I could just ask his brother. So perfect, right? This school year, we went back to separate classrooms. Um, and like, and my husband, and I will be pretty honest. I mean, we're still on the fence about that to be, uh, be completely honest because, um, 
it wasn't horrible with them being together. It was just the reason we separated them because um, one of my sons started comparing himself to his brother. Um, we didn't want him to focus on that. And then, like, you know, sometimes they just are ridiculous. Like twice we got a report of them fighting over a library book. But only my children will be at school getting called down to the office because they're fighting over library books. <sighs> anyway. So this school year we have two teachers and I didn't think much about it. I'm like, this will be cool. We've done this before, but this school year I've been extremely frustrated. K through two really didn't have any homework. Um, homework was like this reading log and I actually wrote an article, three reasons to burn reading logs. So if you don't know this already, I uh, hate reading logs with a strong burning passion. Um, I think reading logs actually kill the love of reading for students, um, but um, I won't go all into that. Not on here uh, today and they had this thing they call the link log so essentially these kids will practice math facts every night and read and each day of the month the parent was supposed to uh, ch make a check mark for math and reading and assign their name what I did kindergarten through second grade for both of my sons I checked marked that whole entire thing signed my name and put it in their folder and left it in there till the teacher took it out and I remember the first time I did it was one teacher I'm like look I'm not wasting my time every night having my child bring me this because we, my kids, my kids went to preschool reading. Okay. They read, um, they read unprompted. I do not have to make my children read. I actually have to, um, take books away from them to make them do other things. Um, that's my experience. My experience is going to the library and being there for hours. My experience is in the grocery store. Like we're not buying a book and having like, I had this elderly lady's like, you know, it's a book. I'm like, lady, you don't understand. Um, I have books everywhere. I have multiple bookshelves. I have books stacked up on the floor. I have books in drawers. Honestly, I had my dad come to my house and put a shelf in my closet where my clothes are supposed to be so I can have another place to put books. So when I tell you there are books everywhere in every room, I did finally take books out of the kitchen because my husband was having comments about it. Um, but now those books, like my bookshelf, I'm looking at it right now. I got books on the bookshelf then I got books stacked up in front of the books on the bookshelf because I have no more space. My dad gave me another little thing and my husband thought I was going to put some other stuff in it. I just put books inside of there. So like reading, it happens in this house. Um, and I gave away probably like 150 books from my house <laughs> last year. And according to my husband, he said he can't tell. So anyway, reading is not an issue <laughs> for my children. And when I'm looking at these homeworks, you know, uh, so, so homework. So now my sons are in third grade. Third grade is the first in Indiana. Um, you get a good um, welcome to standardized testing because not only do you get to take the I learn assessment, you also get to take the I read. So the I read is that infamous test that you have to pass to pass third grade, like because nothing else matters. Then you can pass this test on reading, which is so super annoying because even in second grade, my kids were in what was quote unquote called the high class and in the high class they were making kids do these practice activities to get ready for I read in third grade because there, it was said that some of the high kids weren't passing the test not because they couldn't read but because they were having difficulty was like the phonics portion of the test where you break the words apart because if you're a fluent reader you don't think about breaking the words apart even thinking about all the sounds of it so they had them practice and this is the thing that kind of pissed me off as a parent and an educator. And I wasn't mad at the teacher because teacher's doing what she needed to do to make sure they passed the assessment. And it sounded like it wasn't really an option for her not to do it. Um, but what really pissed me off is like this test, the IRE test is to assess whether your kid can read or not, right? I, you, but the teacher can tell that my kids can read. They're in second grade reading at the fourth grade level. This school year when their assessment came back, both of my sons, they're in third grade. They said they're reading at a fifth grade level. I'm not surprised. But now that we're in this grade of testing, it's like homework went from pretty much that little link log that I had to sign. So really I was doing the homework to like homework is taking forever. And I'm really frustrated about it because I'm like, what are we assessing? Right. And so with one of my son's teachers, you know, we had the back to school night. Well, when you got twins, you know, you got to divide and conquer. So I went to one teacher's class and my husband went to other teacher's class. And then we came together and tried to talk about what we heard. So we could all be on the same page. Then was one of my son's teachers. I came back in because uh, she wanted to do a goal setting conference. We went in to do that. And at this meeting, I asked point blank, are you grading and reading? She says no. But based on other conversation I had with the teacher throughout the school year so far, 
it seems like when I ask questions, it's like, well, that's not exactly what I said. So I'm like, I, if you know me, I don't do that. Um, if you've ever read anything I've written, I'm really clear and direct. Um, hell, I'm an English teacher, so I know how to be clear and direct. Um, I'm very good at that. So I asked point blank before I asked what I really wanted to ask, are you great in reading? So I could have it in writing so it wasn't like a he said, you know, she says, she said, that's not what I said. Because when I, then I, she says no. And then later, it was about a few days later, I said, so hey, this reading log rubric came home, right? So they, they are, the school got rid of their basil they were using and they adopted the Lucy Cawkins, Lucy Cawkins uh, curriculum, right? What's been clear to me is like, teachers don't, what's been clear to me is like, is like, what are we doing with the curriculum? We're, we're kind of adapting to it. And so every time I try to ask questions about it, well, it's like, well, we gotta talk to the literacy specialist. Um, all the emails I have, there really hasn't been a response of this is what the literacy specialist says. I still don't know what this person has said or not said. And so I'm like, well, that's no big deal. I won't even get involved with this reading log. I'll let, cause at the, I was at my uh, one son's back to school night and the teacher's like, I know this reading log seems a lot. And they like asking to write down the name of the book. I think the author of the book, the pages they're reading, um, is it fiction or nonfiction, right? So it's a lot. But the teacher's like, you know, the kids are getting hang up. You don't have to worry about it. So I'm like, I'm not going to worry about it. I'll let my sons do it. And then this daggone rubric comes home and my son earns a C minus. So you already know. And then I'm looking at his grades in my family. We do a um, like we have a like vision and a mission for our family. Right. And it outlines like what our goals are as a family. If you don't do that, I really suggest you do that. So anytime you have an issue in your family, you can bring it back to that mission and vision statement. We have missions and visions for everything else. Why don't we have it for our families? So part of our like our vision, and our mission is that our kids um, earn A's and B's. If at any point in time a B minus appears in your grade report, we are contacting the teacher because that's not acceptable. That's the slippery slope down to a C. And we base this um, goal for our family based on our children's abilities. So if our children had different abilities and we thought the highest they could earn in school was a C, then our mission would have been you have to earn at least a C. But knowing our children and knowing um, their abilities, we made that goal. Honestly, I feel like my kids can earn straight A's, but I don't want to be, you know, extra ridiculous, right? So now my son has a B minus in reading, and he comes home with this reading log where he's earned a C minus. And I'm talking about not like a, a high C minus, like a 70% C minus, which is 1% away from a D plus. So I'm like, okay, what's going on? And so I'm like, I thought you said reading homework wasn't graded because the reading log requires them to read at home and then the teacher says well that's not what i said so you already know what i did i copy and paste it i asked you this question point blank so what are you doing are you grading homework or not so then i get this wishy-washy answer about well we graded some things i'm like what the hell is going on at this school so i'm like you know what i'm tired of talking to you i asked the principal what is your homework policy because in most schools that you work in right there is a homework policy um, outline. So I'll give you one. I worked in the middle school where the homework policy was that the homework was the students would study um, their roots and stems and they would read independently each night. Our school had a mandated reading log, which um, I did not like at all. Everybody knew I didn't like it and everybody knew exactly how imp I implemented it. And I'll be pretty uh, point blank honest about what I actually did. I made it the lowest percentage that I had to make it in my grade book. I made it monthly because everybody else was doing weekly. I'm like, I ain't got time for that. I made it monthly and I just had the kids write the book title in there. And I told the kids uh, the, right before I was going to collect it, there is no way Mrs. Barnes knows what you read. There is no reason for anybody to get a F on this assignment. I'm going to collect your reading log at the end of class. So if there's anything that you need to add to it to make sure you got all your points, I suggest you do that. I will collect them. Everybody will get their points. I'm compliant to the school and not making a big deal out of something that I don't agree with. And, every, and I was blatantly, that's what I blatantly did. But on the other hand, guess who had the highest amount of kids reading? Me, not the people that's fighting back and forth over these daggone reading logs and killing reading in the classroom. Kids read in my classroom because I actually talked about reading, because I actually read the books that my students read, because we're having conversations about it. 
I did stuff to get kids to read that didn't involve a reading law because that's why people said we need these reading laws because, you know, that'll make the kid read. No, actually it doesn't. It's a nuisance and it's a noise. And if that's what you got to stoop to to get kids to read, then you need to question your ability to be effective reading or English teacher. So anyway, so I'm like, hey, well, you know, um, he does have to read at home and it is graded. So then I saw so I'm like, well, if you're not grading homework, take that part of the rubric. And I asked point blank, are you going to take that line out? Well, no, because, well, these other teachers use it. I'm like, and what I've learned so far, there's four teachers in the third grade. One is a high ability teacher. And then um, there's uh, one other teacher outside the two teachers I interact with. Right. And so none of them are all doing the same thing, which is really frustrating as a parent because I'm trying to navigate two classrooms. And here's the thing. I 100 percent support teacher autonomy but i do think that when you're on a team some basic things need to be the same when i was in an english department there were some basic things regardless of what english class you were in were the same for the sake of parents for the sake of when we had god forbid to do a schedule change with schools really try to avoid but sometimes it has to happen right so there were basic things like these are the percentages of the assignments you're going to give these are the type of assignments we're going to give now, you create the assignment, but everyone has to do a memoir, right? Everyone has to do a persuasion, a persuasive essay, right? Just some guidelines, but there was no dictation on what persuasive essay or what historical fiction novel I had to teach. And so as I'm trying to get this information, I'm like, <sighs> in one class, for example, we're uh, teaching uh, spelling. Now, granted, the teacher's like, I'm not teaching spelling, even though I'm giving a spelling test and giving a grade. I'm teaching um, like each spelling list has like a focus, like, you know, maybe it's the double E or the, the long A. Right. So there's some type of method to the madness. Right. But at the end of the day, there's a grade going in the book for the spelling test. My other son teacher's like, oh, I'm not doing that. I'm not grading spelling. Oh, OK. And then I get we're coming home about handwriting. Well, you know, in Indiana, we uh, don't man mandate cursive writing. And last school year, I even asked, are we doing cursive? We'll, we'll try to get to it. We didn't really get to it. And that's cool. Whatever. But it's like when I'm seeing handwriting grades coming home that is low, I'm like, when during the day did you actually work on handwriting with my child? And so this makes me think about, like, what are we assessing and why? Because I feel that sometimes we're just assessing and doing things just to put a grade in the grade book, but it has no purpose behind it. And it's actually not helping the thing that you said you were trying to do. So take, for example, the reading log. And I told this point blank, said it to the principal. I said it to the teacher. I said, this reading log does not make my son a reader. Because, oh, the teacher said, oh, it's going to help his reading skills. Bullshit. It's not going to help his reading school uh, skills, right? No, his reading skills improve based on you actually teaching reading skills filling out a reading log is not teaching my child reading skills what you're doing is trying to hold him accountable for reading but you're not teaching him reading through the act of the law because i can sit there and pretend to read and write down anything on the log or i can sit there and struggle through a book and write it down a law but it doesn't mean i learned some reading skills and i stated that point blank in the email you can tell me whatever you want what you're actually doing is trying to use that as some type of carrot over their head and like you must read right and so like what is the why behind this why are we putting it in the grade book handwriting what is the why behind this why are we doing this why are we saying like hey i need to do this and then uh, my other issue with assessment we shouldn't be assessing anything that we are not explicitly teaching so please show me the handwriting lesson that my son did when you're grading handwriting do i agree that you need to be able to write clearly so someone else can read it yes but i feel as educators we're grading too many things like um participation like I always struggle with grading participation. I understand that kids and um, so if you've ever been in a classroom of mine, I have these essential agreements. They say um, treat everybody the way you want to be treated. Follow directions the first time they're given and be a risk taker and participate in your education. 
The third one is important to me because it does take some risk. It takes some courage to answer things in class. So that's the expectation. However, I'm not going to grade you on it or penalize you from it. You may have severe anxiety. You may have a um, speech impediment. I know when I was in school, I took speech class because I get tongue tied. If you've been listening to this podcast, you know, I get tongue tied. I still get tongue tied. Um, I'm, I'm way better at speaking now, but when I was a kid, I wouldn't answer anything, not because I didn't know it, but because I was afraid of how it would come out of my mouth and how other kids would react. And so when we're doing things just for participation or my other favorite for completion, it's like, what is the point? Because teachers talk about teacher burnout. And one of the things that burn you out as a teacher, and I'm going to tell you this as an English teacher, the thing that burned me out and about killed my soul was grading all this work. And I had a mentor that said to me, she said, Sean Table, why did you grade this? Well, I said, you know, the kids did this in class. You know, I want to make sure I get some feedback. And she said, no, why are you grading this? And I was like, I don't, I don't understand what you're saying. And what this mentor went on to explain, she said, Shante, I'm seeing you every night leave school with this big old bag with all these papers. And she pulled out. She said, let's look at what's in your bag. She put out all these assignments and like, why did you, or why are you taking this for a grade? Why was this given as assignment? What are you assessing after you graded? What are you doing with it? Because what she was trying to get me to understand is Shante, if you gave this assignment for these kids to answer the comprehension question at the end of the story and you graded the answers, right? And you gave it back to the students. Did you do anything with it after that? Or were you simply just trying to get a grade in the grade book? She said, are you looking at it to see what type of comprehension and questions your students are missing? Are you using that data to inform your instruction to reteach? So maybe students are missing questions about uh, vocabulary because they don't understand how to use context clues or break down the roots that they know to figure out what the word means. So are you looking at that? Because she said, if you're not doing that, then what is the point of giving the assignment? What is the point of lugging that crap home and grading it? And that's the conversation someone really had to have with me. Um, that was about mid-career for me because um, this is my 14 years. So around year seven, someone had this, had this crucial conversation with me. I said, what are you doing? So once I kind of quote unquote saw the light, I started reassessing what am I assessing? Do I really need kids to answer all this? What do I need to know? I even maybe look at the questions I'm asking. Am I just asking right there questions just to make sure they read the text? Or am I asking critical thinking questions, questions that are going to get them to explain, to get them to analyze, to get them to synthesize the information to see if I'm teaching them on a higher level? And so if you're an educator and you're listening to this, I really challenge you to look at the assignments you get given. Like right now in most schools, um, we're um, getting towards the end of the first quarter. Right. And so before we roll off into the second quarter, I'm challenging you to look at maybe look at the last 10 assignments you assign your kids. What did you ask those kids on those assignments? Right. Then how did you grade those assignments? So are you did you do completion or did you grade for accuracy? I assert we really need to grade for accuracy. If we're grading for completion, don't even bother. Like, I mean, if you just want to see the kids did something, don't even bother putting in the grade book. You can just do some aggressive monitoring, marking around, put a little check mark on that paper to say, okay, good Sally, good Johnny, good Tyrone, good Jamal, good Tariq, you know. Do that and keep it moving. You don't even need to take that stuff home. Because if all you're doing is grading for completion to make sure the kids know that you expected them to do the work, you can just do a little check mark right there in the classroom. You don't got to take that stuff home. So if we're grading for accuracy, so let's talk about we're grading for accuracy. What are you doing with that information? Are you just throwing a grade in the grade book so you can have X amount of grades? Because most schools have some type of grading policy. Um, like I was at a school where it said you had to put at least one grade in the grade book a week, right? And they kind of started, they, and that was really general because that was really to include the specials and elective teachers um, who don't see, sometimes see students all the time. So that would be feasible for them. But the expectation, especially for a content area teacher like me, was to have more than one grade in there a week. And then my department kind of gave some department <laughs> out uh, great, uh, guidelines for that, right? So are you just giving this assessment or this assignment, right, just to have something to put in the grade book so you can be compliant to some policy or just have something there? Or did you do something with the information? Because that's what's important to me. What are we doing with this stuff? And what is the purpose? If So if you're talking about what did I do with it, are you actually analyzing your data? And I know people get sick and tired of saying, oh, I'm so sick of looking at data. I'm so sick of being data driven. But 
if you don't look at data, this is the two things that happens. Either A, you are reteaching stuff that you don't need to reteach because the kids got it. And sometimes the kids not even going to tell you. Now, sometimes you may have that one kid like we got it, like everybody got it. We all know what assembly is. Why are you going over assembly again? Um, real example for my real life <laughs> that happened to me one time. And sometimes you need a kid that puts you on blast to be like, yeah, probably if I wasn't just grading and putting a grade in a grade book and probably looked at the fact that everybody got the assembly questions right, um, maybe I wouldn't have been wasting their time, right? And then the other piece is, then you're looking at what you really need to reteach. So if everybody's missing, um, we'll stick with poetry, if everybody's missing like the figurative language part of your assessment, then it's like, hey, I do need to go back and reteach uh, figurative language. And let me uh, correct myself. Figurative language is not just for poetry. It's typically taught in a poetry unit, but figurative language is used all the time. So let me clarify that for any non for any English teachers that are listening, because I know they're like, what? Mm -mm. And for any non English teachers that are listening, so I'm not giving misinformation. Right. So maybe on the test, they're missing uh, questions where figurative language is being assessed. Right. So then I'm like, OK, when I'm moving forward in my curriculum, I know I got to move forward. because We all know these curriculums make you move. Right. So as I move forward, how can I incorporate a reteach into my next day? OK, so I'm saying like there's different things we can do to make sure students are working and doing things besides assigning an assignment. Some of that means get off your behind and walk around your classroom because some people be sitting from the back of their class um, yelling at the class, talking about do your work while you up at the desk eating the snack of the desk, uh, sending emails of the desk, scrolling on uh, the Web or uh, on your phone, uh, posting on Facebook and of actually getting up and monitoring your classroom. So some of that stuff can just be solved by you. Uh, well, there ain't no other way to say it, by you doing your job. <laughs> um, most teach, most principals will tell you um, that most of them they didn't even know where the heck I was in the class. Um, the lowest a grade level I've been mistaken for about four years ago, I was mistaken for a fifth grader. OK, um, actually, yesterday I was um, briefly mistaken for a sixth grader. So I guess I am aging a little bit here. <laughs> but um, what I would typically do as a teacher, I had empty desks throughout my classroom strategically placed for two reasons. First of all, some kids only know by a random. Heck, you we all know that one kid, they can be in the back of the room by your desk. They still gonna talk to everybody. It's always that kid, right? So I try to put empty desks by some people so they won't have anybody to talk to. But the other reason there were empty desks so I could sit in them. I would go sit in desks in my classroom all the time. First of all, I made it easy for me to kind of be on eye level when I'm kind of reteaching something. So unless I'm walking around like, mm, ooh, you kind of messed up those last three questions. Let me sit here and just give you a mini one on one reteach right here. So that allowed me to do that without like standing up and looking down at them. I do have long hair and I try to keep it. Actually, I wore my hair down at work yesterday and everybody was shocked. They're like, is this the first time you wore your hair down at work? I'm like, yeah, and I'm super annoyed because I spent most of the day twisting my hair back and stuffing it into the collar of my shirt because it was all on my face. So uh, typically I try, I don't like to bend over kids because I don't want my hair in my face. And I like to be at eye level. So it's more like we're having a conversation, not this big teacher up here. Well, I'm not big, I'm short, but still if I'm standing up, I'm taller. <laughs> Looking down at a uh, kid. And the other reason, it just gives proximity. Sometimes all the kids are working great. And I would just sit at the desk in the middle of the room and just kind of scan back and forth and see what's happening. Just the fact that I was in the middle of the room just got kids to keep working. So I didn't have to necessarily make a grade out of everything. Right. Sometimes we're just doing reflections. Um, sometimes we're just doing stuff for practice. Like right now, my boys have to write like a couple sentences every night because they're trying to build up their reading stamina. I know exactly what the purpose of this time. This time is Monday through Friday. So even on Friday, I got to come home and check this. And I got to sign this thing every single night. So and I get that. But it's like at some point, we really need to think about why we're grading it. Because I even question um, question what they were doing with the homework. Um, what uh, the whole third grade does do does do this one thing. They use class dojo. Um, if you don't already know this, I loathe class dojo. I don't like it. If I, there was if there was one thing I liked about class dojo is the fact that the teacher can post like pictures and videos and stuff. But I like that whole behavior management piece. I don't like it. I don't think it's good for children at all. And I think it's a way for teachers to cop out and not get some real classroom management. Um, I do not use uh, 
I don't like using stuff like Class Dojo. I don't like to be writing kids' names on the board, using no daggone clip chart. My classroom management is me making a relationship with kids and moving my little body around that classroom to let you know what's up. Because what you're not going to do is come into Mrs. Barnes room and act a fool. And this is exactly what I say to students. So I don't know how other people present classroom management or let kids know what it is, but that's how I talk to kids. Because I'm like, what you won't do is step across the threshold into this classroom and act like that so you can step back out and try it again. And I'm going to wait for you to get it together. And that's exactly how I say it. I don't even yell. And that's the funny thing. People are like, I'm, your voice is just, I had a teacher tell me last week, like, your voice made the hair on my neck stand up. <laughs> and I, I'm very stern. I'm very precise with my words. I'm very direct. And I normally work with kids of color. And that's exactly how they mamas and daddies be speaking to them. And sometimes you got to get to them on that level. Like, I am not playing with you. I don't need to clip your name down. I don't need to put your name on the board. I just need, need to let you know. Real talk from me to you. If you thought you was going to come in here and turn up, act a fool, do whatever, clown, it's not happening in here, right? And so sometimes we're using these assignments to dictate behavior instead of doing our job. And so I noticed on class dojo that my kid was getting dojo down for missing homework. And so I'm like, so what is this about? And so the principal comes telling me this explanation about where we're using that um, for organization. Because I, what I questioned was the class dojo score is being used to go on the report card for the conduct grade, right? So I'm like, if homework is academics, right? Why is that going into class dojo? Then it's going to the class conduct score because academics should be in academics and behavior should be in behavior. The principal says, well, it's not uh, because she's not grading homework for accuracy um, and she's just checking like if they're actually doing homework, it's actually an organizational skill. And so that can be counted. So I was like, fine. At the end of the day, my son has good behavior, so I'm not worried about his conduct score. But anytime there's something that is um, off, I ask questions. What gets me as a black parent? As a black parent, I know that I am perceived by some people at my son's school as aggressive and ridiculous and doing too much. But what's interesting to me, white parents complain about stuff all the time and they may be, oh, you know, that's, you know, so and so Sally's mom's a helicopter mom. But black parents are angry, mean, aggressive. And they I came to meet with them one on one. One of my son's teachers wouldn't even meet with my husband and I one on one. She started requesting us meet with her in the office. I had never raised my voice at this woman. I hardly even interacted with this woman. But some of the things that she was saying to me, like one of the complaints she made about my child, I'll tell you two complaints she made about my child. One was that he was standing at his desk doing his work. I'm like, was he being loud? Was he disrupted? No, I want children to stand, uh, sit down. I said, well, I'm going to tell you right now, my son, and I did an article where I actually showed my son sitting up in our house um, doing his homework on the paper on the wall. I said, my son likes to lay on the floor. He likes to stand up to do his work. So I said, that's going to be between you and your, you and my son because I'm not going to have a conversation with him about sitting down in the chair because he's not disrupting your class. So you have to decide whether you're going to make this a thing or you're going to allow him to do his work because what is more important, him doing his work or him sitting down? I said, you're going to have to figure it out. I'm not getting involved. And that was my husband and I's stance. So she didn't like that. And then she come back saying, your, your child always wants to sit close to me on the carpet during reading time. Um, he needs to, um, you know, not sit there all the time. And I told my husband, did this individual really send me an email to complain about how my kid is sitting in the front row while you reading the story? Are you for real right now? So this same teacher, see, y'all see, I'm not being extra here. This same teacher is like, oh, I, I can't meet with him one on one. Lady, you the one being ridiculous. But OK, we can go meet in, meet in the office. But as a parent, it's my right to ask questions. And teachers, if you're doing stuff, if you're assessing stuff, if you're giving homework and you're giving assignments that are out of pocket, expect some questions and expect to have some uh, expect to provide some answers. And furthermore, expect to make some changes if you are wrong, because parents like me. We're not going to back down and go away and shrink back because you want to beat around the bush and be uh, wishy washy. You know, no. So my, my message today um, to educators is think about the why behind what you are giving as an assessment. Do not give assignments just for the sake of giving them. 
don't give assignments so you can make kids be compliant and do a task when there are other things that you clearly should be able to do. And if you can't do it, get guys on that. Don't use work as a punishment for children. OK, because I hate that. Oh, so, oh, so I'm just going to get more homework for y'all tonight since, since y'all misbehaving in class. Maybe you need to address your classroom management. Maybe that's why people turn up in your classroom. Maybe if you put the daggone cell phone down and I stand in the back of the room giving dojo up and dojo down and actually get by some kids and give them some eye contact and use some proximity and, you know, put some structures and some routines in place. Maybe you would have better classroom management and not have to use work as a threat to get your class in line on top of do, using that ridiculous class dojo. Right. So that's what I want you guys to think about. What am I assessing? Why am I assessing it? And what the hell am I doing with it? That should be the question you should be asking yourself for every single thing that you do. The reason why you should be asking this stuff, because it will inform your instruction. And secondly, it will cut down your workload. One of the major things that happened when my mentor called me to the carpet about what I was doing is that, hey, me bringing this big old bag because I have my backpack. This is the thing. I have my backpack, my purse and my lunchbox. And then the bag I carry to school to take the papers back and forth from. Once she pulled me to the carpet and like, Shantae, what are you doing? That bag that I was using to just to take the papers back at home, I, I dropped that. So the only thing I was carrying was just my backpack, right? I got my life in order and it got me more time back for my personal life and for time for my family and my children, my husband and my children, right? So there are benefits all around. And so I hope if you get anything out of this message today, you um, take a time back and reflect upon what you are doing and the why. So thanks for listening. Until next week.